Hello and welcome to this lecture on chapter 4, Input and Output. In this chapter we will be looking at the most common input devices and the most common output devices that you are going to run across and be using personally. From input devices, this chapter talks about keyboards, uh, pointing and touch devices, scanners, readers and digital cameras, and audio input, those four main categories of input. And on output, this chapter discusses uh, three main outputs, display, visual related outputs, printed hard copy outputs, and audio output. The reading and the chapter goes into more material than what we're going to do in this uh, recording, but I do want to highlight these main categories here. First of all, keyboards are discussed, and they're actually discussed at a significant length in the chapter reading. And as you read it, you'll realize that they're more complicated and more interesting devices than you probably realize. We almost take them for granted, uh, but there's a lot of thought that goes into the layout and the design and the functionality of a keyboard. And there are standard keyboards and there are all kinds of cool keyboards. Our chapter talks about uh, flexible keyboards and, and you know, roll it up and take it with you on a job and uh, some other types. One of the things, for example, are the function keys that you may have not thought that much about before that are part of a standard keyboard. The function keys are designed to uh, allow programs to have added functionality. So what the F5 key does, for example, in Microsoft Word is different potentially than what the F5 key does in PowerPoint or Adobe uh, Photoshop or Microsoft Money or some other program completely different. They, their function can depend on the program they're using. Now, an exception to this is F1 key, which has become the universal standard for help. When you press F1 in almost any program, any context, it'll pull up the help for that program. It has become the de facto standard. But generally speaking, the function keys, their behavior was different program to program and even sometimes uh, context to context within the same program. That cartoon, by the way, at the bottom of the screen, the guy's drowning and he's yelling F1, F1, F1 because he's calling for help. See, computer people are funny. Your keyboard also has a layout of the keys. Have you ever noticed the keys are not alphabetical? They're in some, and you know, I mean, I know you've noticed that, but have you thought about it? Why aren't they alphabetical? That would make it easier to learn how to type when you're first learning how to type. Where's the R key, right? Where's the P key? Once you get used to it, you're perfectly fine with the key the keyboard layout we have. Well, the keyboard layout that's standard, which is shown at the top of this slide, is called a QWERTY keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. And it's called that because if you look at the upper left-hand letter, it's a Q, and then the letter to the right is W, then E-R-T-Y. So the first six letters starting at the upper left-hand left corner are Q-W-E-R-T-Y, and it's called a QWERTY keyboard. It's the de facto standard, but it doesn't have to be. And other keyboards have been tried, and people have created other keyboards. Dvorak is the name of uh, last name of a person who was trying to research this and figure out a faster way of doing keyboard, trying to place um, keys in a more strategic position. And uh, this person uh, built the keyboard, and this keyboard has been tested experimentally by numerous groups. Sometimes the groups show a slight performance increase on the Dvorak keyboard over the QWERTY keyboard. Other research projects show that there's no difference behind it or even slower difference, uh, even a, a loss of performance by using the Dvorak keyboard. The fact is human beings are very adaptive. And once you've learned your keyboard and your style, you become very effective with it. And uh, another keyboard isn't going to make that much of a difference. The keyboards, we see these on our uh, variety of devices where it's physical keys that you can tap or it's keys on the keyboard, uh, the touch screen that you're typing them in. And we're going to continue to see innovation as people uh, try to adapt to human desires and human needs. If you're not using a keyboard but you want to do input, you have the option of using some type of a pointing device. A mouse is a pointing device. It sits on your desk and you move it up and down and left and right or, or you know, along two axes, vertically and horizontally on your uh, desktop. And as you do, the mouse moves correspondingly up and down, left and right on the screen. 
So it's a type of pointing device. I'm moving the pointer by moving the mouse. Your finger is a pointing device. It's the most common pointing device. We use fingers more and more and more as we're seeing touch screens becoming more and more and more popular. When uh, Steve Jobs was announcing the iPhone, when he was first introducing the iPhone, he got a round of applause for saying the iPhone used a finger for input and didn't use a stylus. Styluses are kind of going away. They were, for a while, the big deal that people were using for doing uh, inputs. But as uh, touchscreens have gotten more sensitive, the needs for styluses has decreased. You still see styluses at times for uh, certain contexts, but just standard, simple uh, user interface. Uh, for an average user, uh, the finger is going to be a bit more common pointing device than a stylus. The book talks about mice, just like it talks about keyboards in more detail than you realize there was. Turns out mice are more sophisticated than you realize they are. It's just something very intuitive. You sit down, you grab a mouse, you move it and click it, and it works. But you'll learn some things about mice as you read the chapter. Touch screens, the same thing. You sit down, you touch a screen, it does what you want it to do. But there's a lots of different types of touch screens on lots of different devices. And in this chapter... Uh, just as you read that, just be aware of, of what's going on. Now, you don't have to memorize all the devices that have the touch screens. But it's good to uh, uh, let that information kind of uh, flow over your eyes. And then the styluses and the pin-based, again, these are actually decreasing in popularity. Our book talks about them more than it probably needs to, given their lack of uh, uh, growth in the marketplace, but actually their decline in the marketplace. But they still have a lot of purposes, especially on the lower cost screens, uh, like at a checkout counter or, or the, the surfaces that you want to be more robust, you might see those uh, pin based. They're also used for artistic purposes where you want to change color and do some functionality. They're, they're not going away completely, but they're certainly not going to uh, um, be as popular as just the simple uh, touch screens that we have on our cell phones and on our tablets that we use our hands for. And there's other pointing devices that are less common than styluses. Uh, other versions of mice, uh, Game Boy controllers, and, and uh, musical input devices, and using MIDI to uh, get your data converted. If you're a musical person, you're familiar with that format. But just suffice to say, there are lots of ways of getting our data into our system. Okay, quick quiz. There's only three quizzes in this. Uh, this is a short lecture, and the chapter has a lot of material, but you get through the, uh, the essence of the chapter is pretty straightforward here. An optical mouse is uh, A, the same as a wireless mouse. No. Uh, wired and wireless has nothing to do with optical or um, physical with the little trackball, uh, the little physical ball that rolls around. B, a mouse that tracks movements with light instead of a ball. Yes. See a mouse that contains a scroll wheel at the top. Again, the mouse can be uh, laser or the other and still optical or the older format and still have the, the thing at the top. So B is the right answer there, and I can look down and see that B is correct. True or false? With handwriting recognition, text is input as a graphical image so that uh, the text cannot later be edited as text. Um, actually, that's false. I, I guess it's possible to treat your signature as uh, text, but in general, handwriting recognition, it does convert it to text. That's the goal of the handwriting is to type it, is to uh, replace typing letter for letter to be able to sign or handwrite uh, the letters. Three, an input device that looks like an upside down mouse with a ball on top. That's a, a trackball. That was one of those devices that are not very common, but uh, there's lots of those devices out there. Some of you one or two of you may use the trackball. So it's, it's a physical device that sits on the desk and doesn't move. And instead of moving it around, you spin the ball. Uh, this has the same functionality as moving the mouse. And sometimes in a limited desk space, there might be reasons why that's better. How it works, box. Uh, our book has tangents about current events and other things going on. This is one that I think is really kind of cool. So I'm actually going to talk about just briefly here, this notion of augmented reality. Now, this is different than virtual reality. 
virtual reality is you put on a pair of goggles and you're on Mars, or you put on a pair of goggles and you're in France, or you put on a pair of goggles and you're in Middle Earth, right? and you're not, you've left your house, you've left Bowling Green, you've left the world, the real world around you, and you're in some virtual world where everything you see is generated by the computer. Augmented reality is the real world around you with digital information added into the real world or augmenting, supplementing, enhancing the real world. And this is going to be one of those big things moving forward. We're going to see augmented reality become a very big deal. Uh, and we'll talk some more about this in class lecture, but I wanted to go ahead and give the authors credit for uh, pointing out something that, that is going to be a big deal, this augmented reality. Okay, so we're still talking about input devices. But we have some uh, other ways of getting data in that's not so much for personal use, but very common in business. The idea of using scanners, for example, um, and readers and cameras. Now, scanners are different than readers. Scanners, uh, they're very, very similar. But when you think about a scanner, what you're thinking about is taking some document and getting it into your system for storage purposes or for processing purposes. So you might take a... Uh, um, a flatbed scanner and you scan a document or a series of documents, you might take uh, a scanner where you scan photographs, uh, something like that. With readers, it's not that you're taking a document that you want to digitize and record for later. It's just a way of, of tracking things. So a barcode that you have on shipping materials, um, that barcode is not... It was designed for computer use. I guess that's the difference, right? If you think about a Word document, if you think about a, a letter that was written from a person to a person and you want to scan it into the computer as a copy, a barcode is created with the intention of being read by a barcode reader. A barcode is not created with the intention of being used by a human. So I think that's kind of the rule of thumb, right? Scanners take human do documents and make them into the machine, and readers take uh, data that's designed to be read and read that. Now, the reading of that data has a variety of uh, uh, ways it can be done. Sorry, scanners first, and then we'll talk about the uh, uh, the readers. Um, what do I want to say about this? I think I just said this very thing, that we take human documents created for human consumption and get a digital version of those. That can be, uh, now there's advantages. Once you've digitized it, you can copy it. Uh, it's not going to lose its information. It can, uh, uh, doesn't degrade over time. The, the Constitution of the United States is a physical document. It's been scanned, of course, but the actual physical document is deteriorating over time, deteriorating over time. Ones and zeros, when it's on computer storage, it's not going to deteriorate over time. 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now, those ones and zeros will still be there and the document will be exactly the same. Uh, oh, this is good. When we're talking about scanners, it is important. Here's a couple of terms that you want to know. Optical resolution um, measured in dots per inch. So as you scan, one of the things you have to do is you have to say how detailed is the scan going to be. And that detail is determined based on um, DPI, or dots per inch. And as you have higher resolution, more dots per inch, You've got a bigger file, so it takes up more memory, but you also have more detail and more accuracy. And with a high detailed scan, you can actually zoom in on it and still have a pretty high quality image when you're, set and, when you're all said and done. Okay. So when you're scanning, it'll ask you what DPI do you want to use. 300 DPI is going to give you a pretty good uh, resolution if you're not going to zoom in on it. If you're going to scan it and you want to zoom in on it later, you'll want to go to 600 DPI. Maybe even a little bigger if you're going to uh, you know, zoom in even more. Now, the readers, and again, the readers, their purpose is to read uh, information that's recorded for the purpose of being read. So the barcodes you see there on the right, like you have on a can of soup or you have on a uh, um, tag on a piece of clothing when you're purchasing a piece of clothing, that code is there because it represents a whole lot of information, the shipper, the date it was created, the price, and so on. And it's designed to be read by the barcode readers. And there's a number of these barcode technologies out there. 
on the bottom right, we have probably um, not the most common because the original barcode, flat 1D barcodes, but of the 2D barcode options, that one on the bottom right is probably the one you've seen the most. It's called a QR code, and it's a two-dimensional barcode. Right? So it's actually using information on both the horizontal and the vertical axis to store its information. But these are, uh, again, it's a nice way to get a lot of data uh, stored and these are used in a number of uh, business situations. The grocery store at your local checkout, your local Kroger, your local Walmart, used to be manned by human checkout clerks and human stockers that would go through and not only restock the shelves, but and that's still done by humans, uh, but they'd go through and they'd change the prices on each of the items. That was, and, and they do inventory by hand on each of the items. How many cans of chicken noodle soup do we have? How many boxes of Fruit Loop cereal do we have? Now all that, that uh, uh, inventory management and pricing of the products is much more automated. The inventory is completely automated. When the distributor brings in five, uh, five boxes or 50 boxes of Fruit Loop cereal, that goes into the database for the store, and the store knows there's now 50 more boxes of Fruit Loop cereal than there were before. And as every person checks out and decreases the one more box of cereal, it's updated in real time. So the store knows, the store manager knows in real time what's going on. When this was done pre-barcode readers, when it was all done by hand, uh, managing inventory was a real problem. And you'd go to a store, and there was you know, a real possibility that they were not going to have the items you want you wanted in the store because they didn't realize they're getting low on inventory until it was too late and it took a day or two to bring those back in and we see these barcode readers and scanners all over the place as cool and powerful as barcode readers are and as much as they have impacted our ability to manage inventory and and help with control this new thing called RFID and it's it's been around for you know a decade or more but radio frequency ID is going to potentially do what barcodes have done in the past, but do it at an even higher and even better level. So instead of having to physically scan each device to know the boxes as they're moving through your warehouse, an RFID sends out a radio signal, not for a huge distance, but a big enough distance that you can have a radio signal antenna receiver in the area and each box as it goes through basically announces itself and you put on that rfid tag the information you want to have so it might be hey this box contains uh you know f eight pairs of you know specific brand of tennis shoes or this box contains 20 boxes of fruit loop cereal and the rfid tags announce themselves and the inventory management happens automatically it's just a cool technology and it doesn't require the physical optical scanning box by box by box. Rather, it can use radio frequency to announce itself and the radio receivers to collect its information. Kind of a neat idea. And we see uh, here in this figure from the book a number of examples where RFID tags are being used in industry. Finally, wrapping up uh, this the rest of the input here with other types of readers. There's optical mark readers. Uh, like the Scantron that you use with the number two pencils. There's optical character recognition, OCR. This is uh, the ability to scan a document, not just to make a copy of it, but to understand the text, to convert it to text, not images. Uh, magnetic ink character recognition. This is especially common in the banking industry. The checks, next time you write a check, look at the bottom of the check. And when you look at the bottom of the check, you'll see your banking number and your routing number uh, written in the bottom in some weird numbers. Turns out those weird numbers are actually uh, have magnetic material inside of them. And it's able to uh, um, not just see those numbers, but read them at a very high speed with magnetic information. And if you ever get a canceled check back, look at the bottom of a canceled check and you'll see in the bottom right hand corner the amount of the check was printed onto your check in the bottom 
so that uh, as part of the processing of that check. Biometric readers, where your body, your biology, your eyes, your fingerprint, your voice is uh, used as input. So we can see those as well. Right? So biometric readers, this is kind of a cool thing that's going to get bigger in the future, not smaller in the future, especially as we deal with issues of privacy. Uh, the fact that you want to verify that you are the person making a purchase, that you are the person authorizing an activity, that you are the person you know, doing some event. Uh, your fingerprint, your eye print, your voice print, anything that's that's unique about that's uniquely you uh, can be how that how that's done and we even see these you know on your smartphone some of the new smartphones and laptops have this uh, biometric fingerprint reader or voice or eye uh, as a way of doing authentication that's a trend that's going to increase in the future digital cameras uh, are an input device as well Right. And they're input because they take something from the real world and convert it to ones and zeros so that it can then be processed. So it's definitely an input device. Uh, the camera in your smartphone is a very advanced camera according to uh, uh, state of the art four, five, six, eight years ago. But there are some high end digital cameras that are even um, better than the quality of your cell phone. If you're wanting to be a uh, sophisticated uh, photography professional where you can control the lens aperture opening and the, uh, the speed that the lens opens and closes, shutter speed, uh, if you want to use advanced lenses and all that. So that picture, that Nikon, I think is uh, one of the best selling digital cameras on Amazon. I just grabbed the figure from there. And uh, the picture on the right is just the digital camera that's built into a smartphone device. Audio input, so we have the ability to use microphones to get input into our machine as well. Uh, there's two kinds of ways of doing this. One where you just take the data and you just pass it along without filtering it. Like if you're doing uh, voice over IP, if you're using Skype to have a conversation with another person, um, it's not converting what the person says. It's not You're not trying to interpret or do commands based on the voice of the other person. You're just trying to pass it along. Here's what the person said and, and uh, without any interpretation. It's more interesting to say, well, I want it to understand what I'm saying. I want the computer to understand if I'm saying something. Siri, you know, what uh, what's the temperature outside? I don't want that information just passed on to somebody like voice over IP. I actually want the machine to respond to that. So that's speech recognition, which is a little more advanced than just audio input. And with speech recognition, we can do some advanced things. And again, that is growing, not decreasing in its influence moving forward. Quick quiz number two. Which of the following is used in conjunction with Scantron test forms, volet, uh, voting ballots, and other documents in which the selection is bubbled in? Uh, so that would be... Uh, Mark recognition, the M O M R C, yes, C. True or false, flatbed scanners can be used to scan photos as well as documents on conventional paper, and that's absolutely true. And then three, a voice input system requires software and something else in order to input voice data or commands. So you have to have software and you have to have the microphone. That's the physical device that uh, um, takes the sound waves and converts them to ones and zeros. Okay, what about output? So we talked about input. Uh, we talked about basic input, keyboard, mouse. We talked about business inputs and others. Now let's talk just a little bit about outputs. Most common output device is a display, whether it's a screen on a desktop, which we call a monitor, or it's a screen on a cell phone or a tablet or a notebook, uh, which we call just basically a display screen. Could also be the, what you might see at a checkout counter or, uh, um, uh, you know, Anywhere you're looking, even a television screen would, would qualify for this. This is by far our most common uh, output devices. And there are some terms that you want to know from uh, display output devices. Aspect ratio is the ratio of the width versus the height. So if we say 4 colon 3 is an aspect ratio, that means uh, there are 4 units across the bottom for every 3 units up. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about inches or you know uh, um, feet 
All right? The ratio stays the same. Four units across the bottom for every three units going up. 16 by 9 is more of a letterbox uh, newer format. The 4 by 3 is um, an older format that was used on uh, the old CRT monitors. Um, we're moving toward a wider and wider aspect ratio. And resolution is another term that you want to know. A pixel is a single picture element that's made up of red, green, and blue RGB colors. And the intensity of those three pixels, uh, those three colors within a pixel, gives us everything from complete black, where there's no red, no green, no blue shining at all, it's just dark like in a cave at night, to where the lights are completely on. And we get white when we have, interesting, when you have red really intense, green really intense, and blue really intense, you end up with white. And all the shades in between those. So 8 bits per color would give you 24 bits of, of uh, uh, per pixel and would give you uh, 16 million or so shades that you would have the possibility of working with. Now, that's just one pixel. Your screen resolution is how many pixels do I have across the bottom by how many pixels do I have in a vertical axis. So 1024 by 768 means there are 1024 pixels across the bottom and 768 pixels across the top and you multiply those together and that's how many pixels there are on the entire screen. You can change the resolution without changing the screen size. You can increase the resolution giving you more pixels and a smaller images on the screen or you can uh, have a higher, res uh, uh, not a higher, but you can have a resolution with fewer pixels where uh, the images are a little bit bigger if you have poor vision, but you don't have, you can't get as much information on the screen. Our book talks about CRT monitors probably more than it needs to because you're not going to use the old, big, fat CRT monitors. Um, we've been completely replaced and it talks about monochrome displays and all of those and I guess in some like at the the ATM machine is monochrome potentially and the gas station checkout display is monochrome so there's times where you're going to see those but for personal use you're not gonna have a monochrome monitor I used one in the past but I'm a lot older than you are you're not going to use a CRT monitor on a new purchase of a computer from Best Buy or from Amazon uh, I lug CRT monitors around back in the day all the time. Uh, some of you who are gamers, I've been told, uh, still like to use CRT monitors. Uh, CR the old CRT televisions are apparently better for playing Smash Brothers, according to the Smash Brothers Gamers Group at Western Kentucky University, which meets on Saturdays, if that's something you're interested in. But our book says some cool things, right? It talks about, for example, using dual displays. And if you haven't done this before, uh, you need to look at the back of your computer and see if you have more than one display connector on your computer. There are three common types of displays, and there's more than just these three, but these are the three most common types of displays for your computer. The old standard monitor port, which is an analog port. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see the digital visual interface port, which is more rectangular and longer than the audio port, uh, and it's completely digital. D in DVI stands for Digital Video Interface. And it makes sense that you would stay completely digital because the data is digital in on the, the video card and in memory and in RAM in the computer. And the old CRTs were analog, but the new, uh, uh, new displays, new flatbed displays and LCDs and OLEDs and all of our new display devices we're going to talk about, they're actually digital, unlike the old CRTs. So there's no reason to convert to analog. Just leave it digital the whole time. So DVI gives you slightly better quality going from digital video card to a digital display device without converting to analog and back, which is what you have to do with the standard port. HDMI is even newer than the DVIs, um, and that's the port that you're becoming probably even more familiar with. We're seeing more HDMI ports than we are um, even the DVI ports. They're more universal in that uh, they're used for both displays and for televisions. Oh, and uh, my point was, sorry, I didn't get to say this. If you've got two or more of those on, the, on your video card, on your computer, then absolutely try hooking up two monitors. Even if they're different sizes uh, and, you know, one's CRT, the old one, and one's a flat display or whatever it is, go ahead and hook them up because your operating system 
uh, should detect that and immediately allow you to use both of those. More display devices, we talk about uh, wearable displays, and this is uh, something that Google came out with, uh, among others, and it was uh, not a huge hit, but again, it you know they're they're they learned from that process and they're going back and revisiting it. Other people looked at it and are working on it. Microsoft, we're going to talk in class probably about the Microsoft Hololens. Uh, Microsoft's coming out with their um, head wearable display. We've got the uh, virtual reality head wearable displays. This is going to be big, right? It's not big today, but it's going to be big in the future. Flat panel display technologies. Um, the reason we don't have those old, big, heavy television CRT monitors is because we have small, flat, new technologies. And even the small, flat, new technologies are being replaced by newer, smaller, flatter technologies. So we used to have LCDs, but LCDs are being replaced by LEDs and OLEDs, where OLED is organic uh, light-emitting diode. And the key word O for organic there is it uses a different science behind its ability to generate its color, its light, and it's allowing for devices that are even brighter and even lighter, and the material can be flexible. So we're going to see some very interesting displays in the near future. You're used to hard display devices that break if you drop them. Uh, but flexible displays are being developed and researched and will be brought out to market in the near future, and cool things are going to happen from those. What about printers? So displays are the most common, which we just talked about. Printers are also a common output, and our book talks a lot about printers. I'm surprised how much they go on to say about printers. Suffice to say, the two most common types of printers that you're going to deal with are inkjet and laser. And inkjet is what you're probably going to purchase for yourself because it's the most affordable, it does a good enough job, and it's quick and it's quiet. If you have a printer in your dorm room, it's probably an inkjet printer. And yes, it literally jets or shoots ink onto the paper. An inkjet printer has a very tiny nozzle that's able to squirt ink onto paper and it uses three colors and a mixture of three colors as it squirts ink onto the paper to get all the various colors that you can see. A laser printer is a more sophisticated, more expensive, more professional printing device. This is what they have in the campus labs when they're printing out lots and lots of out, uh, pages of paper for students over a period of time is what they have in most business settings, especially business settings where you're doing lots and lots of printing. It's going to cost you more money up front to buy a laser printer, um, but you're going to get a speed performance and you're going to get uh, a lower cost per sheet. So if you're printing thousands of sheets a month, then it's probably worth the cost to do a laser printer. If you're printing 50 sheets a month or less, you probably want to stick with an inkjet printer. The laser printer actually uses the technology of a Xerox copy machine. The same way a Xerox copy machine works, that's how a laser printer works. Right. Uh, which is different than shooting ink onto the screen. It actually takes an image of the entire uh, uh, document and puts it on a drum that spins through it. I think our book probably talks a little bit of the details about it. Um, just know that it's not shooting ink, rather it's using a different technology, and it just happens to be the same technology that Xerox has used. We don't use um, the same resolution term we're talking about, the printer technology. What we use for the resolution here is our dots per inch, DPI. Printed output is measured in dots per inch. 300 dots per inch if you look closely at it, put it under a microscope, uh, microscope, put it under a, a, a magnifying glass, you will see the rough edges. The Herald newspaper and the Daily News and the USA Today and all newspapers, they're printed in a lower DPI resolution because they're used for a day and then thrown away. So they're going to use a low cost printing. And if you look at a newspaper and look at it close, you'll see it's kind of got jagged edges. A higher quality 
higher quality, longer term printout, like your textbook, for example, especially a bound color textbook, if you look at it under a magnifying glass, you'll see it's got really smooth edges, even on the smaller letters. And that's just because it's printed at a higher DPI. And then there are special purpose printers, like uh, you can print barcodes that you can then use with scanners. Uh, you can print uh, uh, um, photographs with photo printers. The printer at the checkout, at the grocery store, and at the ATM machine, it's a special type of printer. It's not an ink print, inkjet printer or a laser printer. It's its own printer. And, and there's others. The coolest is 3D printers. 3D printers are amazing, and I'm not going to go into detail now because we're going to talk about this in class. 3D printers are really cool. Uh, if you want to YouTube 3D printers, uh, you'll be amazed, and but we'll talk about this uh, in class a little bit. And just like you can do audio for input, you can also, of course, have audio output. You can have headphones that you wear. You can have uh, speakers that you place. Uh, on your desktop, you can have earbuds and ways of getting sound or audio out. So our third and final quick quiz here. Number one, what is the following? Which of the following types of display devices should have the largest footprint? And the old CRTs, uh, flash in the past, letter A would be correct there. True or false? Laser printers can only print in black and white. That is false. Laser printers are the high-end printers that use the same technology as Xerox. They're what business and professionals use, um, and they can definitely do color. And then the last one, an inkjet printer uses and creates its image by shooting ink onto the paper. Absolutely, it does. Okay, so what we looked at in this chapter was keyboards, and pointing and touch devices and scanners and readers and audio as inputs. And for output, we looked at display devices, we looked at printing output, and we looked at uh, audio output. Have a good day.